Church, our goal is to glorify God as we worship, serve, connect, and give. All that we do should align with these four words. As we reach people with the gospel, as we praise God, as we share the gospel and serve our church and community, as we connect in life groups and intentional discipleship, and as we are biblical in our stewardship, First Baptist, let's focus on making disciples and garner as we worship, serve, connect, and give. Good morning and welcome to First Baptist. Thank you for joining in via our live stream. We are so glad that you are tuning in to worship with us and to hear the preaching of God's word this morning. I want to start by telling you a couple quick announcements of things we're doing in the next few weeks and months here at First Baptist. The first thing we've been talking about for the last several weeks is our Pray For Me campaign. We're going to be going through these books together this summer as we seek to pray for the next generation. If you would like to partner with us in praying for a student or a kid, zero to 18, uh, that's involved in our church, please reach out to me. Uh, you can send me an email, alex at FBC Garner, and I would be glad to bring you a book because some of you I know are at home and you're not able to get out of the house. You're not able to come pick one up at the church office or come on a Sunday morning uh, to get a book. And if that's you, I still want you to be involved. If you will commit to pray for a student every single day, all summer long, please come get one of these books or please email me and I will be glad to bring you one. You don't want to miss being a part of this because praying for the next generation is such an important thing that we've been called to do by God. We know that the most important thing that our children or grandchildren can do is to come to know Jesus in a personal and saving relationship. And so if you want to partner with that, please reach out. Another thing that I want to tell you about is on May the 31st, we're going to be doing a 24-hour fast as a church. Yes, 24 hours of not eating food. And if you can join us in that, we really want to encourage you to abstain from eating food and then come and break the fast with us together as we have a meal. We're going to have some tacos. It's going to be a great night. And our whole purpose for doing this is to celebrate what God is doing in the life of our church and in the life of us personally. It's going to be a great time. You're not going to want to miss it as we gather together to pray, to eat some food. But also, on top of that, we're going to have a special way that we're going to give praise for those things that God is doing in our lives. Ways that he's working. And we're going to acknowledge that together. And then we're going to have a discussion led by our deacons on the book we've been going through all semester long called Kingdom Prayer. And so I really hope that you will come out and join us in doing this fast and this celebration as we praise God. On top of that, though, I want to acknowledge that many of you might not be able to fast from food for 24 hours. And if that's the case, still sign up for the event because there is a video and there is a document there to explain other ways that you can fast, other ways that you can participate without fasting from food for 24 hours. So please don't just hear that and tune out. We want you to be involved in every part of glorifying God together as a church on May the 31st. So please join us. You might be wondering, Alex, why are you talking to us on the live stream and not to the people sitting in the auditorium? And that's because this morning, part of the service was pre-recorded and part of it's going to be live. And so the worship that you're about to experience as you sing praises to God is from a previous Sunday morning. It's been pre-recorded and uploaded. And that's because we have a worship candidate here with us this morning, and we are not live streaming that part. But the sermon will be live at the same time that it is every Sunday morning. And you will be able to follow along as we study our passage out of Mark chapter 11. And then on top of that, we're also going to spend some time in prayer for a specific group of our congregation. And you don't want to miss out for that prayer time either, which will also be live. Thank you for deciding to worship with us here at First Baptist Garner this morning. I hope that you enjoy the service.
church now is the time that you can stand and let's give a mighty shout to the king of kings and the lord of lords and the king who rose today today we celebrate blessed be the god and father of our lord jesus christ according to his great mercy he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of jesus christ from the dead sing with me this morning he is risen
quickly. I know that all of you have watched a ball game, maybe between State and Carolina, and you've seen that last minute buzzer beater. Or you've been watching football over at Carter Finley and somebody throws that pass and they score the touchdown at the very end, or better yet, it's been Master Sunday on the 18th hole and someone puts a putt in to go to the top of the leaderboard. Today is that clutch moment. Today is the buzzer beater. Today is the day where Jesus Christ conquered death and a throng of people gathered here today can go wild in praise and adoration and absolute joy in what he did for you and for me on the cross. Sing it with that joy. But the angel told the women, don't be afraid because I know you were looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He has been resurrected, just as he said. I cast my
What amazing praise. Lord, we thank you. There are not enough words. There are not enough things, Lord, to express our gratitude for the amazing gift. We praise you, Jesus, that you are risen, that you are living, and because of you, we have eternity to spend praising your holy name. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Have a seat.
Father, we come to you right now extremely grateful for what you're doing in the life of our church. Father, we just want to praise you for your goodness, for your grace that you so freely give us that we don't deserve. Father, we thank you for the salvation that we have in Christ Jesus that we've sung about just these last few moments. Father, I pray that as we transition into our time of studying your word, that your Holy Spirit will help us to apply these truths to our lives. Give us understanding. Give us wisdom. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning, we're going to be studying Mark chapter 11, 20 through 25. And we're going to be looking at the fig tree. When Jesus cursed the fig tree, and they come back and it's dead. But before we get into that story and read the passage of Scripture, there is a lot that we need to understand. Because this passage is so often used incorrectly. It is used by the people who would say that you should name it or claim it. Or prosperity, false gospel teachers to say things that it doesn't. And that's because we don't understand the Jewish culture of the time. We don't understand the teaching surrounding it. And so I want to take us back to the week leading up to Jesus' death and resurrection, what we call today Holy Week. And so I want to go back and paint a picture of Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday of that week. As Jesus sets aside a goal of teaching his disciples and the people also traveling with them what the new kingdom of God is going to look like. The coming kingdom that is ushered in by his death and resurrection. And so we go back to Sunday morning, what we call Palm Sunday So when we come in and we shake the little palm branches, if we have those, and sing Hosanna to the highest in church, well, the same thing was occurring several thousand years ago when Jesus came into the city of Jerusalem on a donkey. And they were shouting, save us, Hosanna, save us, bring in the kingdom of David. That's what they were shouting to him as they were laying their clothes and these palm branches before his feet. You see, they were expecting him to bring in a new kingdom, to come in and to kick out all the Romans and say, no longer are you going to enslave these people, no longer are you going to oppress them. He also, maybe they also expected him to come in and say, you know, King Herod, no longer are you going to be here in your corrupt ruling of this Jewish people. Ruling your own people for the benefit of the Romans. They were like, no, kick him out. That's the kingdom they were expecting. But as we clearly will see over and over and over, the things that Jesus does and teaches has a completely different message. And so he continues to go in through Jerusalem, and he goes all the way up to the temple. Most likely for an hour of prayer. The Jewish people gathered in the temple three times a day to pray. At nine, at twelve, and at three. And most likely, he was going up for that hour of prayer with his disciples. And that's all we're told about the first day. He goes back out of the city, and he goes and spends some time with his disciples, and they sleep. And the next morning, they come back in for another famous story that we know. But we kind of skip over the fig tree part. And so on their way back in from Bethany, about a two-mile hike up to the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, off in the distance they see a fig tree in full bloom with huge green leaves. Probably a pretty massive tree, an old fig tree, right outside of the city. And as they're approaching, this is the only time in Scripture we're told that Jesus is hungry. Now we can assume that many other times he is hungry because we see him over and over eating meals with other people. This is the only time we're told he was hungry. And that has some deep significance spiritually. And we'll get to that in just a moment. 
But as they approach this tree off in the distance, he's hungry and he's like, there's some food. There's a snack. It's kind of like for us if you go out to a restaurant with your friends and the waiter decides not to bring your food all at the same time and you kind of want to be polite. And so you're just sitting there like twirling your thumbs, staring down at your plate like, when are they going to bring everybody else's food? And you keep waiting and you keep waiting, and then finally they bring out the other food. And then you're like, okay, time to dive in. And, the, and somebody's like, nope, wait, we got to pray. Got to bless the food first. And so then the person who's the most long-winded at the table decides, all right, I'll pray. I got it. And then here about what feels three or four minutes later, they wrap up their prayer after they prayed for every single person sitting at the table. And finally, ten minutes later, you get to eat your food. This long wait for fulfillment. And so you think about these disciples and Jesus, hungry, walking up to approach the fig tree. But when they get to the tree, there are no figs on it. It's barren. And that might not surprise you because it tells us in this account that it was out of season. And you might think, well, why in the world would someone expect there to be figs on a tree when it's not the season for them to grow? All right, that would be kind of strange. It's kind of like if you go up to a blueberry bush and you're like, I really want blueberries, but it's not summer, you're not going to get blueberries, right? Dead winter, there's no blueberries on the tree. Maybe that's more relatable to us around here. But you see, the difference is a fig tree never has leaves on it before it has fruit on it. The fruit always comes before the leaves. And so any time you see a fig tree with leaves, you're at least going to expect to see these little green buds about this big. And then they slowly grow and ripen. But they're edible the whole time. Those little green buds might be a little bitter. They might be a little tart. But if you're hungry, they'll sustain you. It's kind of like if you see a worm crawling around the ground. If you're hungry enough, you're probably going to pick up the worm and eat it. You all laugh because, right, we can't relate to that because there's food everywhere, right? Really good food, delicious food that doesn't taste like dirt, right? Isn't bitter. But in this instance, they were walking up to a tree, and from miles away, they could tell there's probably going to be some fruit on it for us to eat. But there isn't. And if we just stopped there, we would miss the meaning completely. We need to zoom back out and see what was probably right behind that fig tree. As they're walking up to Jerusalem, the thing that stuck out above the city that you could see from miles away as you're approaching in to Jerusalem is the temple. And so when you look and you see this fig tree with its leaves, and behind it you see this huge temple, they have to be connected. You have to relate them to one another. Because if you study the Old Testament, you're going to see over and over again, that the people of Israel are connected to a fig tree. They're symbolized in the book of Hosea and the book of Jeremiah as a fig tree that produces fruit when it's healthy, when it's being honorable and pleasing to the Lord. But when it's barren and just has leaves, it represents people that have gone astray, who have turned their back on worshiping God. And if we continue to look at this passage and what's going on, Jesus continues to walk after he curses the tree for not having fruit straight up to the temple. This is a very familiar story, and all i got to do is one symbol, and it's going to tell you exactly what he did. He flipped the tables. He comes in to the market outside of the courtyard, and he sees them using a place that is supposed to be a house of prayer, a place to worship God as a place for their own economic benefit, robbing their people out of money by saying, okay, you need to sacrifice a sheep. Well, I'll sell you one, but for three times the price. Oh, you can't afford that? Well, I have some doves, but you're also going to have to pay way more than that for those. You want to exchange your grain for something that you can submit for this type of tithe? Or you're bringing money and you want to change it back into grain for this other type of tithe? Okay, but I'm going to tax it like crazy. I'm going to take some money. I'm going to cheat you. And so he comes up and he says this very well-known line, you are treating 
a place that's supposed to be a house of prayer as a den of robbers. A den of robbers. And then he leaves the temple to go spend another night with his disciples. And the next morning when they're approaching the city, we run into our passage of study today. They encounter this fig tree for a second time, but it's dead. It's withered from the ground up. It's been killed. Foreshadowing what he's going to tell in just two chapters later in this address. One day later, the destruction of the temple which occurred in 70 AD as Rome came in and took every stone and dispersed it. And even today, there is not a single stone from the temple some 1,975 years later on top of the Temple Mount. For over 1,970 years, there has been no temple. Let's read our passage from this morning. If you'll look down with me at the 20th verse of chapter 11. It says this, early in the morning, as they were passing by, they saw the fig tree withered from the roots up. Then Peter remembered and said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree that you cursed has withered. And Jesus replied to them, have faith in God. Truly, I tell you, if anyone says to this mountain, be lifted up and thrown into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will happen, it will be done for him. Therefore, I tell you, everything you pray and ask for, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. And whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against someone, forgive him, so that your Father in heaven will also forgive you for your wrongdoings. This is God's word. It is true, and it is given out of his love. So in this passage, we see them come up to the fig tree, withered, dead, showing that the people of Israel are unfruitful. And because of that, they are going to be withering away. Their religious system is going to fade into existence. The next part of this passage might seem random or out of place to you. If you're studying this whole entire narrative, like why is Jesus stopping to say, if you have faith, if you pray, if you forgive? Next to saying, there is a withered fig tree. And that's why we need to understand that the fig tree represents Israel, and he's also talking about the temple. In the Old Testament times, in the Old Kingdom, the Old Covenant, it was centered around the temple. If you look at 2 Chronicles chapter 6, verses 19 through 21, you're going to see that Solomon, as he was commissioned to build the temple, he said a prayer over it. And in that prayer, he was very clear to express that the people of God, the Israelites should pray facing towards the temple. That they should pray in the temple. And that if foreigners from another land come and pray in the temple, planning to worship God, then God should answer and hear those requests. You see, in the Old Testament, prayer was centered around the temple. You would pray in the temple three times a day. You would turn towards the temple to pray. But not only was prayer focused around the temple, faith was also focused around the temple. You would come and you would journey to Jerusalem for different feast days that they had. You would come there to commit sacrifices of animals for the forgiveness of your sins. You would travel Thousands of miles if you had to. A lot of miles. All the way from Ethiopia, like the eunuch did, to encounter the presence of God if you believed 
it was truly in this temple. People brought grain and money to the temple for their tithes. It was the center of everything of Jewish life. Even some rabbis go far enough today and for the last 1900 years to say this, prayer ceased for the Jew when the temple was destroyed. Because it was everything. It was the presence of God on earth with his people. But you see, what Jesus is doing here is he's saying, in this new kingdom that I've been teaching you about, disciples, that I'm going to continue to teach you about, it is no longer centered around the temple. It's now centered around me, around Jesus, around Christ. It's different. So I want us to briefly talk about these three things that he points out. We're going to talk about faith, we're going to talk about prayer, and we're going to talk about forgiveness. It tells us in our passage, Jesus replied to them, have faith in God. And truly I tell you, if anyone says to this mountain, be lifted up and thrown in the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes what he says, it will happen. He's saying here, have faith in God. Right now your faith revolves around that temple, around the Jewish religious system. But when that withers away, you're still going to have faith. And you're going to be able to say to this mountain, get up and be cast into the sea. And no, we don't actually mean that they could say, or we as Christians today could say to a mountain out in the mountains of North Carolina, get up and move if we have enough faith. It's an expression of speech in the Jewish times for things that were impossible or deemed as impossible to move mountains. Just like today, if I said Hogan is a goat, you don't think Hogan has horns walking around on four legs, right? I would be saying that Hogan is the greatest of all times, right? There's a difference. He's not a goat, right? It's an expression that we use, mostly about famous sports players or actors, with a different meaning, not literal. And the same is true here. Mountain moving is just doing something that is deemed impossible. But then we have to add another step on top of that. Because he doesn't just say, you can move a mountain. He says, you can move this mountain. Remember where they are, overlooking Jerusalem that sits on a mountain with a temple mount inside of it. One of the biggest miracles we see throughout the scriptures is Jews coming to a saving faith in Jesus. The miracle, a transformed heart, a transformed life as they follow the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. So faith, now, is surrendered and centered on Jesus, not on the temple. The second thing we see in this passage is it talks about prayer. It says, everything you pray and ask for, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. As I said in the Old Testament, they would face the temple. They would go to the temple in prayer. What Jesus is saying to them is you don't need the temple. Because no longer are you praying towards it. No longer is it your method of intercession with God. But now I am those things. And through me you pray. It's changed. The perspective has shifted. And then lastly, it's forgiveness. In the Old Testament times... They had to take animals and slaughter them for the atonement of their sins, to push back the wrath of God. But as I hope you know, there's a sacrificial lamb who died once for all, and his name is Jesus. He changed it. No longer do we have to go to the temple today and sacrifice a bull or a sheep or some pigeons we just surrender our life and believe in Jesus. 
It's different. It's been shifted. So you're probably sitting there thinking, Alex, how does this apply to my life? My life was never centered around a temple. And I would say, yes, that's true. I hope your life was never centered around the temple. Since you're not Jewish and it doesn't still exist. But on top of that, I can guarantee you this. That every single one of you in this room, including myself, struggle to have a life that is Christ-centered. It's difficult for us to lay down things because of Jesus. I titled the sermon today, Painting a New Kingdom, because I think that's what Jesus does the entire Holy Week. As he changes the perspective, as he gives them a cross-cultural method, as he defines what it actually looks like, for the Messiah to come and to live and to die. To shift what it looks like for him to be the king of kings. What a new kingdom that's not going to just say, okay, Rome, get out, is going to look like. He changed their perspectives. He even said some of the distractions, the religious distractions that they have, those have to go because they're no longer being used to worship me. They're being used for your own benefit and your own gain. So what I want you to picture right now is that we as Christians need to put on new lenses, have a new way to view our lives. Because I fear that so many of us have let things creep in and come into our lives, some things that are religious, some things that are culture that had shifted our perspective in each of these three things. What we see happen with faith, first off, is we start to doubt the things that God says. We start to spend a little too much time around TV shows that maybe push the envelope a little bit too much on what is morally acceptable. And then we start to doubt, well, maybe it's not actually that bad. Maybe it's not actually wrong for someone to do that or for me to do that. We start to blur it up a little bit. Then we move on a little bit more. We start to experience things with our other friends or situations in our life, and we start to doubt the goodness of God or his justice or his power because we're like, If I'm going through this, God would intervene in my life. Therefore, he must not exist. But we see in just a couple more chapters in the book of Mark that Jesus, God's only son, who came in human flesh, knelt down in a garden and prayed for the cup of wrath to be taken from him. And he got a swift and utter no. That is not my will. My will is for you to die for the people of the world, to redeem them. So we start to doubt our faith. We start to let things creep in. But then we get to prayer. And I think we can all relate that there are distractions in our life that keep us from praying. Things that on themselves aren't really bad. They're fine. Some of them are even great. But if you start to replace your prayer time with anything else, then you're not being faithful what God has called you to do. Because Christian, your most important relationship has to be with Jesus. He has to come first. You have to prioritize the time that you spend with him. Scrolling for hours on social media does no one any good. Honestly, you're going to sit there and you're probably going to start to compare yourself to other people. Or you're going to start to think down about other people. It's just going to get worse and worse. I love TV and I love movies. But there's got to be a limit to that. Spending all day on a weekend binging a show 
instead of spending even 10 minutes in prayer with God is an issue. Working all the time, even if you need the money to provide for your family, you have to be willing to sacrifice for the things that are important to you. And if Jesus is important to you, you need to spend time in prayer with him. And the last one we see up here is forgiveness. And I think this might be the one that creeps into our religious system the most. We can come and we can gather in here this morning, the 350 of you in this room. And I guarantee you, with no doubt in my mind, that there are people sitting in this room right now who have sinned against someone else in this room. Or they have a grudge against someone else in this room. Something that needs to have reconciliation. If we look at the parable of the unforgiving servant that Jesus taught, he is very clear that we who have been forgiven of everything have no right to hold back forgiveness from someone else. And so I think sometimes we can come to church or come to a Bible study, we can get into this little habit of just simply talking about someone else in a way that is not uplifting, that's not encouraging, that turns into gossip or slander. And if that happens, we need to go to that person and say, I am sorry for the way that I talked about you. And that person has to be willing forgive. Lastly, I want to say this. There are probably several in this room who don't even know that they've sinned against someone else in here. That the way that they treated their actions were completely dishonoring to the Lord. That were unhelpful in even the slightest way. Where scripture is clear that the things that come out of our mouth should be uplifting to the Lord. And so what I want to do right now is I want to transition to a time of prayer for you. Because I think that our lenses, like these that I just sit here and rubbed on paper with sandpaper for the last 10 minutes, I can see nothing really when I look out here. Because I think we get distorted. Our view of faith, our view of prayer, the distractions that come into our life completely mess up our view of Jesus. And that he has to be the center. We have to be willing to sacrifice for him. And so what I want to do is that this morning, you have the boldness to say, you know what? I want some new ones. I want to just destroy those lens that I have. And I want to get right in my prayer life. I want to start saying, you know those things that are causing me to doubt? Let's deal with them. Let's take them to the Lord. Don't take the doubts and run away. Run to him. Process through them. He has an answer. And then lastly, this week, I want to challenge you. There's someone that you have something against. Go to him. Be willing to say, this is hard for me to say to you. I don't really want to have this conversation with you. But the Lord has told me that I have to have this conversation with you. Let me pray for us. Father, we come right now asking for boldness. Father, we acknowledge that it is not easy to live a life that is centered on you. We acknowledge that in this very moment, our heart is conflicted because we have things racing in our minds of how we doubt you, how we doubt your goodness, how we doubt your moral standards that you have given us. Father, give us the strength to say we are going to follow your word, your standard. We are going to acknowledge that you are good and perfect and sovereign, and we can trust you with our lives. Father, help us to remove the distractions that are hindering our relationship with you. Help us to be a family that is centered on Christ. 
That if other things are getting more attention, help us to be willing to cut those out to follow you. Father, I pray the person in this room right now who has heard the message, they know they need to forgive. They're sitting in their seat right now wrestling with the fact of, can I do it? Or the one who has someone on their mind and they've already decided they're going to do it. Father, I pray that you help them to carry through that. Give them the boldness to not care what the consequences of them confessing their need for forgiveness to someone else. Because most of all, God, we are here to please and worship you. Father, I pray for those in the room who don't know they've harmed someone else in this room or sinned against them. I pray that you bring conviction to their spirit right now in this very moment. We pray all of these things in the powerful name that is above every other name, and that is the name of Jesus. Amen. At this time, I want to call Dr. Mary Johnson. Oh, she's already over here, ready to go up to the stage. I said this um, back in the spring when we were talking about pouring into the next generation, that no one in my life has taught me more about prayer than this woman right here. If you don't know who she is, she's the director of Be Tell at Camp Caswell, and she has impacted so many people. I can't tell you the way that she's impacted my life because not only has she taught me about prayer, but under her ministry, I met my wife at Caswell. So that's great, right? <laughs> not only that, she's the one who connected me with Ashley to come and to serve here. And so I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for Mary. And so, so much of the big turns and pushes that the Lord has used has been through her. And so I've invited her to come up and to share a little bit about faith in Christ, what prayer looks like with Christ, because she's been through a lot these past few months, and some of you know that and have been praying for her. And so in just a moment, I'm going to give it over to her, and she's going to share a short testimony of what the Lord's been doing Before I do that, I want to say this. She has this common phrase that some of you have probably heard before. And it's any time we see the Lord do something miraculous, we say, go God. And because I won't get a chance to say something after she speaks, I want to say this. I want to say, go God, for what he has done in Mary's life over just the last few months. I love you. Yes, I'm a good one. Have you ever felt overwhelmed in the presence of God? This will be my 23rd year to direct camp at Caswell. I see, yeah, go God. I see about 15,000 people a year in the ministry that God has blessed me with. It's just amazing to think what he can do with some crazy woman that goes around saying, go God, go God, go God, because it's not about me, it's about him. And I've learned that more in this time uh, this year. Uh, Our theme for this summer at camp, and our teenagers from this church are coming, is all about spiritual warfare. I don't think I really understood spiritual warfare like I did after spending so much time praying and seeking the Lord in this. Because there's a battle going on. You and I don't really recognize it as much. But there is between Satan and God. And Satan wants to be God. He can't. He doesn't have the power. But you and I give him a lot of power. We allow him to speak into our minds and our thoughts and our actions. Make us be selfish. Forget what we're called to do to make much of God. And so that has been a huge deal for me is that Wow, we never talk about spiritual warfare. I have a committee that helps me with the, uh, planning the program each year. And uh, in our church, Ron's been on that committee. Ashley's been on that committee. And now Alex is on this committee. And they help me think through all the things that we need to talk about. Well, let me tell you, this year, 
we decided, yes, let's talk about spiritual warfare. So I was studying really, really hard, trying to make sure I had it straight. Uh, as Baptists, do we really understand it? We, we should, because it's real. And it's what you and I struggle with, but we just don't want to name it that. So I spent uh, all January, December and January, uh, studying, researching, trying to figure out the, for uh, finishing up the material for this summer. And I was obsessed with it because it unlocked so many things that are in my life and in your life I know too that we, we get stopped by things because our eyes are not on Jesus. It's on everything else. And so Satan uses that to discourage us and to take our eyes off of him. And so this year... Uh, Knowing that the deadline was coming, for some reason, I couldn't put it down. I kept studying. I kept reading. I kept wanting to learn more and more, so we got it right. I literally, for four and a half days, didn't sleep, eat, do nothing else, but keep writing. I'd wake up in the middle of the night not able to sleep. I needed to write, needed to write, needed to write, make sure it was right. Because it's new for us to talk about, but yet it's so big for us to talk about. I just submitted the final... Uh, wording, I was done, somebody else was going to edit it, and literally just went, yes, go God. I pray you work this summer like never before. And I went to sleep. Somewhere during the night, I had a massive stroke. I couldn't talk clearly. I couldn't function clearly. Uh, it just messed me up. Uh, I didn't even realize how bad, because I was going to do one thing that next day. And women, you know how important it is to get your hair done. Okay? So I was going to Tammy to get my hair done. And I showed up there, and that's where the stroke became apparent. And thanks for David rushing me to the hospital. I began a journey that I'm still on, but boy, I'm talking now. The doctor said, yeah, thank you. The doctor said that uh, I wouldn't recover well, uh, that I should have died over and over again. My two-month checkup, all seven doctors said that. They said, you weren't supposed to live. I said, well, go God. He must have something big in store. Because <laughs> guess what? This summer, we're talking about spiritual warfare. Only one of those doctors was a believer. He stuck around after to tell me, you go, girl. Don't you stop. Y'all, this is what we're studying we don't talk about this enough, but there is a power that tries to shut us up, and that is Satan. He's trying to tell us, no, no, you don't talk. I'm going to make you so scared. I'm going to make you afraid you're going to lose your friends. I'm gonna f Everything, every fear you've ever thought, I'm going to throw in your face so that you'll be quiet. And the whole time, y'all know Jesus already won. As believers of him, we've already won. The battle's going to be there, but we have won because we have the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives that goes to battle for us. And so the more I've spoken about him in these last couple of weeks as I've regained my speech, you see, the first thing I couldn't even do was read, and I read a lot. The only word that I could read, looking at my text and things coming in, was the word prayer. Everything around it was blurred, but prayer. So I just kept praying. I couldn't talk some days, so I just kept praying. In my mind, I just kept saying, God, take over, take over, take over. We want to see a movement of God like we've never seen before. We have students that are hurting. They're looking at everything else in culture to give them answers, and they're not going to find it. And so I stand here today victoriously saying, you go, God, because I'm with you. I know that you have saved me for a purpose and saved you for a purpose. We just got to quit being quiet about it. Speak out. Be bold. Let people know. Y'all know there's a saving faith, faith in Jesus Christ, that for all eternity, all eternity, we're going to be with him, lifting him up. The more I heard those doctors over and over and over say, you weren't supposed to live, I knew deep within, oh, yes, I was, and you better watch out. <laughs> so I'm telling you, be bold. Speak about him. There's a hurting world. The very first time I shared after the stroke where I, had, I could speak and make sense, 18 students accepted Christ. And all I could say was, you go, God. It's going to happen. So I'm asking you today, 
Pray for this summer. Pray for camp. We'll have 7,000 students come through camp, and guess what? They're going to hear about a powerful God that can take somebody that was told over and over again, you should have died, and he can reclaim me and you to be bold in our faith, to stand up and not be silent. That's my prayer. I pray it's yours as well.